Today is Father's Day. Amen. And I, I've been honored. And again, thank you, thank you guys for those kind words. So those meant so much to me. But I want to honor all the dads and granddads that are here today as well. Give me if, all the grand, dads and granddads. If you guys want to just give me a wave. Actually, if you guys could stand, we want to honor you. All the dads, all the granddads in the house. Yes. Wow. All right, all right, all right. Amen, amen. If you guys want to remain standing, you guys are a blessing. What a blessing you are. You guys are uh, amazing people. Uh, we want to honor you. Actually, we've got a special gift that we want to put in your hand as our way of saying happy Father's Day from Epic Life Church. And the ushers are coming right now. We have got our five-minute Bible study for men, specifically handpicked by me because we know that men like to study in five minutes, right? Get it over with, get it done. So we want to put one of these in everyone's hands and the ushers are coming right now to give that to you. And we want to bless you with that. We've got some more stuff. We've got donuts for dads. How many guys are going to just slide the, the diet out for today? And it's, you know, just it's Father's Day. And we've also got some, uh, we've got some sliders and some stuff, right? We've got some great food, right? Just for dads. I was told just for dads first, if there's anything left over, then the moms, I guess, can, can share it with you as well. But, but I want to encourage you guys to spend at least five minutes of your day reading scripture. And it's, it's, it's a really cool book. Minutes one through two as you read scripture. Minute three, it goes over understanding and pondering thoughtful questions. Minute four, apply, read a brief devotion. And minute five, pray. So it's got it all broken down for you. So let's give it up one more time for all the dads and all the granddads in the room. Amen. Did everyone get one? Everyone got one? Good. Three star. Here's one. There's one right here. Awesome. Awesome. Amen. Well, today I want to honor my dad. For those of you that don't know dad, my dad transitioned to heaven about a year ago, a little bit over a year ago, last May. Um, he went on to, on to glory. And, uh, you know, you never get over the loss of your dad, but you just get through it. Amen. How many have lost a dad? Amen. How many are grateful we have the promise that we're going to see him again one day? Amen. For those of those that were believers in Jesus' name. But I just want to give you just a little short background of my dad and where I come from. And some of you have already heard me say this. Some of you have seen me sh share this. But uh, there's a picture of me and my dad right there. Let me stand out of the way. That's me on my seventh birthday with my first guitar. And that's in Queens, New York, Jamaica, Queens, New York, Richmond Hill. And uh, how, how you get uh, like the, uh, the tie, the, the 70s <laughs> thing going on? It had the big ring, you know, that you slip the tie through and all that. I think they had that on the Brady Bunch and the Partridge family. But uh, that was, dad always made sure that I, uh, he equipped me uh, musically. Anything that I was interested in doing musically, he said, okay, we're, there was no money spared, no expense spared uh, for anything having to do with music um, because he knew that I was going to use it for God and for God's glory. Amen? Amen. But my dad was born in Catania, Sicily, in, uh, and he migrated to America in 1946 at the age of nine. Dad and mom were married for 61 years until the time of his transition to heaven. <clears throat> Mom and dad had four kids. I was the oldest. They raised all of us to love God, to love music, to love our country, and to never be afraid of hard work. Amen. Dad used to always say, no worky, no eaty. <laughs> and he meant it. Dad was a general contractor for over 60 years. He put the first hammer in my hand. I don't know if there's a picture of that one with the hammer in my hand. When I was just five years old and growing up in an Italian household, there it is, I still had that hammer. Amen. Uh, growing up in an Italian household, honor and respect was always taught, exemplified, and instilled in us at an early age. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Growing up in the Munizzi household, attending church <laughs> was a non-negotiable. And we attended church every time the doors were open, even when the doors were closed, because my dad always 
was working at a church somewhere, doing something, painting, carpentry, remodeling. And dad used to always say, as long as you live in my house, under my roof, you live by my rules. Amen. The most important area that dad influenced me in was to love God and love his word. The Bible declares in Proverbs 22, 6, to start your children off on the way they should go. And even when they're old, they will not turn from it. Proverbs 15, 5 tells us, only a fool despises his father's advice, but a wise son and daughter considers each suggestion. And in Proverbs 23, 22, it says, listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother either when she is old. Amen. Amen. Dad was always quoting scripture, always quoting scripture. And two of his favorite scriptures was Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And his second favorite verse was Mark 9.23, nothing is impossible to them that believe. And during one of dad's last conversations with us before he passed on to heaven, he was still quoting scripture. Even on his deathbed, right before he went home to glory, he was quoting scripture to us. So dad, we wanna wish you a happy Father's Day in heaven today, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. You know what, listen, I'm so grateful for my dad and I'm grateful to be a dad. I've had the privilege of being a father now for over 30 years and you've met our three kids, uh, Danielle, Nicole, and Nathan. Someone once said, being a man is an honor, but being a father is a privilege and a daily choice. Amen. A privilege and a daily choice. Pastor Martha and I dedicated all three of our kids when they were just a few weeks old. We get dedicated them in church to God and Today, they all serve here at Epic Life Church, and Pastor Martha and I are so blessed to have them as our family. You know, Pastor Martha's been teaching for the last two weeks about pride, amen, and how it can affect our relationship with God and with others. But real quick, I wanna talk about the good or the healthy side of pride. How many of you guys wanna hear about the good side of pride? There is a good side of pride, amen? As dads, we're proud of our accomplishments and of our children. So I'm very proud of my kids, so can I brag on them for just a minute? Amen, I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm proud of how my daughters lead us in worship every single Sunday. I'm proud of the many hats that they wear at Epic Life Church to help us grow, how they facilitate our music ministry, our kids' ministry, and our youth ministry, and how they raise up leaders and take ownership of this church. I'm proud of their talents and musical abilities that God has blessed them with, and they, in turn, have taken that and giving it back to God, and he's blessed them for it in so many, many, many ways. Uh, Nicole has a brand new song. She was a so part of a songwriter, one of the songwriters on a brand new song coming out on Tasha Cobb's new album this month, uh, the Sanctuary album. She co-wrote one of the songs on that album. Yeah. Our very own Nicole Dunizzi. Amen. Danielle has also written so many songs. Danielle is a, has, uh, was nominated for a Dove Award many years ago for co-writing one of the songs on Pastor Martha's album. And um, we're so grateful for that. God's blessed them in so many different ways. You know, and I'm also proud of how my son, Nathan, treats this building with so much care, maintains the sound and lighting equipment, jumps on ladders in the middle of a service when one of the light bulbs goes off. How many of you guys were here that week? <laughs> I'm proud of his commitment to writing songs and working hard on his musicianship how he volunteers to take our young guys to go to Andretti's. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for a guy's night out so he can build relationships with them. I'm proud of all of my kids. Let's give it up. Can we give it up for, amen, thank you. Dads aren't perfect, but we've been chosen by God to love, protect, provide, influence, and speak blessing over our children. Yes. Amen. Yes. Well, today I want to share a word of encouragement for all of the dads and granddad's in the room. I just wanna say, dear dad, don't give up. Dads, don't give up. Amen, how many of you have ever felt like giving up? Well, my word of encouragement to you today is do not give up. If you brought your Bibles, please turn them to Proverbs, the 13th chapter, 22nd verse. We're also gonna throw this verse up on the screen for you as well. As this morning, we're gonna encourage some of the most necessary, essential, and underappreciated people on the planet, fathers. Fathers are not just men who make babies, fathers are men who choose to raise babies. Let me say that again. 
Fathers are not just men who make babies, but fathers are men who choose to raise babies. And I want to tell each and every dad that's here how proud I am of you because it's never been harder to be a dad than it is today. We live in a world where if the economy gets tough, it's dad's job to still make sure there's food on the table. If the world gets scary, it's dad's job to make sure everybody feels safe. Whenever the answers are hard, it's dad's job to give clear answers and clear guidance, even when situations may seem impossible. It's dad's job when kids need answers. It's dad's job when teenagers and even 20-somethings know everything <laughs> to patiently wait for them to understand there's more to learn. It's dad's job when something breaks to know how to fix it or Google it or YouTube it. And when homework is hard to be able to solve it, everybody needs dad. Amen? Amen? And in our Western world where our heroes don't get to show any kind of weakness, dad has very few places where he can go and demonstrate that he needs a place of safety and refuge in this time. So men, today, I want you to know, as much as people need you, there is a God who loves you and he is for you. And today he wants you to spend time with him. He understands how you feel. He knows the path that you take. He wants you to put your trust in him so that you would lean on him and not on your own understanding. He wants you to follow him so that as he guides you in the path that you should take, that it provides a refuge and favor and blessings upon your family. He wants you to talk to him as you pray so he can show you the plans that he has for you. He wants to give you the strength that you need, and he wants to give you a refuge through every storm. As much as we need dad, we also need God because he's on our side. And if God is for us, who can be against us? So today, by God's grace, it is my prayer to use his word and the power of the Holy Spirit to inspire every man to be a godly father and grandfather. So today, let's turn to Proverbs 13 and verse 22 and read the words of King Solomon, who's the wisest man who ever lived. It says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, use your word today to help us understand what it means to leave an inheritance to our children and our children's children. Let this word encourage and inspire those who are in this place that have the honor of being called Father. Let this be a a generation that raises up a righteous revolution, that way we may be one nation under God again. It's in your name that we ask these things, and all of God's children said, amen. amen, amen. If you haven't received one already before this day is through, I'm sure that dads everywhere are gonna get cards of appreciation, cards of sarcasm, cards of humor, words of encouragement, ways that your family has chosen to express how much you mean to them. And those are all wonderful things. But the title of today's message that I see is the thing that your family would write in the card if they could truly tell you exactly how they feel. Dads, dear dad, don't give up. Don't give up. Whatever you do, dad, don't give up because in the world that we live in, there is an entire generation that is suffering from situations where fathers have forfeited the opportunity to do what God has created them to do. They've given up. Some have given up and walked out on their family. Others have given up and they're present, but they don't give any direction. Others have given up simply because they don't know how to do what the word of God describes as being a godly father. They weren't raised by godly men. Maybe they were raised in situations where dad wasn't there and so they throw up their hands and they say, I don't know what to do. Don't blame me. It's just the way that I was raised. But today, I not only believe your family doesn't want you to give up, I know that our God Almighty doesn't want you to give up. His word says you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And what you need to understand is that your role as a father is the foundation of the entire nation. Can I say that again? Your role as a father is the foundation of the entire nation. That's the way God set it up. You're the one who defines the family. You are the one who gives them identity, not the culture, not the world, 
not the latest thing out there. You are the one that provides identity to your family and to your children. You're the place where self-confidence comes from. When I went to school many, 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 many years ago, I had the self-confidence that I knew who I was in Christ. That was instilled to me at an early age by my dad and by my mom. I knew what I believed. I knew where I belonged. And whenever the teacher gave information that was contrary to what the word said, I was able to say with confidence under my breath <laughs> that they were wrong. Why did that happen? Because I had an identity that was connected to my family that started with dad. And today we live in a world that's doing everything it can to identify every group that it can. But the one group that it wants to do away with is the family. The family is under attack. You see it every single day in America because the family is the foundation of society. If you dress a certain way, they'll call you a hipster. Based upon when you were born, they'll identify your generation, right? If you're born after this certain age, you're Generation X. How many Generation Xs in the room? How many know what a Generation X is? If you're in this group, you're a millennial. Then they're talking about Generation X, they're talking about millennials. If you're in that group, you're a Generation Z, which I think I automatically fall in, don't I, because it's me, Z? No, the Z? Oh, okay, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe. Try to slide that in. So based on what you do, if, if you like to play video games, you're a gamer. How many gamers in the room? I'm looking at the tech. If you like to eat food, you're a foodie. How many foodies in the room? If you like to watch this certain show, you're a Trekkie. Any Trekkies in the room? What's a Trekkie? <laughs> we are fans of the, the Star Trek TV series. Star Trek Enterprise. Beam me up, Scotty. Depending on where you live, you could be a metro. What you like, you could be a retro. Based on what I've seen lately, there's a few uh-ohs and a few no-nos. I'm sure you can uh, sympathize with me on that. And what this does, it defines us in so many ways, but it eliminates who we really are. We're defined in our social circles. We're defined with our friends. We're defined based on our economics but we don't know who we are at home. We don't understand where we come from. We don't have a foundation for decision-making on the most important days of our life to say, this is who I am and this is what I believe. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. When you read Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 22, it gives us this instruction. Say it with me, a good man, there's the qualifier. A good man leaves an inheritance, not just for his children, but for his grandchildren. Now understand, this verse includes your economic resources, but that's not the only inheritance that this verse is talking about. It's saying that a grandfather gives to a son, who is the father, knowledge of who they are and what they believe. And that is passed on to the grandson. When you look at the Jewish culture today, they are still carrying on the traditions of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses established 4,000 years ago. Why? Because they have left an inheritance not just to their children, but to their children's children. It's an amazing culture. You know, one of the things that's wrong with our nation today, we are forgetting in the short period of 200 plus years what God has done in this country. Amen? Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, all the freedoms that we enjoy as a country. There's no other country like it on earth. We're not perfect but we still are the greatest country on the earth. I believe that, you don't have to believe that, but I do. We've got one generation that's so disconnected from the next generation that there's a young generation that has no place to find out their identity. They don't understand how the fingerprints of God are all over the foundation blocks of this nation. And now they're rewriting history and trying to tell the world how bad we are instead of how blessed we are. I'm going to say that again. They're rewriting history and trying to tell the world how bad we are instead of how blessed we are as a nation. And we are blessed. Amen. 
So what changes that? You do, Dad. You have to take on the responsibility of identifying for your children who they are and who God is in their life. The problem is that for the last 60 years, the divorce rate in this nation has done nothing but climb, and Dad has been gone so long in some circumstances that his children don't want him in their life anymore, which means that their grandchildren have no relationship with their grandfather. Men grew up in situations where they were struggling to understand who they were because dad was out of the picture. And now if dad wants back in the picture, they say, no, your place has been removed. So today I want to take you to a place in the word of God where we see a miracle work of reconciliation because the individuals that were in this situation simply chose to forgive and understand what it meant to be blessed of God from grandfather to father to son. Talking about the story of Joseph, amen? Stories found in Genesis, the 48th chapter. And there in Genesis chapter 48, you read in the first two verses that Jacob is very old. It says, now Jacob is weak. Jacob is the father of Joseph. Joseph is now the prime minister of Egypt. He's like the second in command of the whole nation of Egypt. It says, it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, indeed, your father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Understand that at this point in Joseph's life, he didn't, he was the prime minister of Egypt and he didn't need anybody. The story of Joseph has been told over and over, but when we look at the latter days of his life, we see the work of God's grace. Why? Because he had a reason to hold a grudge. If anyone had a reason to hold a grudge, Joseph did. Joseph grew up in the tents of Hebron, but now he sleeps in a palace in Egypt. Joseph spent his childhood chasing around sheep in the desert, but now he's pulled through the streets of Egypt in a chariot with stallions. Joseph is called the second most powerful man in the world. Pharaoh has told him, only to me will you answer. There isn't anyone else that Joseph has to explain himself to. He doesn't have to sit down for meetings. He doesn't have to do any Zoom calls. <laughs> Joseph is a powerful and influential individual who is being given credit for saving the known world at that time. If there was a prize, he won it. If there was a magazine, he was on it. He was on the cover of Charisma, Forbes, <laughs> Success, all the magazines of his day. Joseph is the guy. And in this passage, he hears, your father is sick. And Joseph runs to him. The Bible says that he was so hasty to get to his father that he saddled his own horse. Now, what's the significance of that? When you have this much power and you have this many servants, as he did, you don't saddle your own horse. People saddle them for you. But Joseph was so eager to see his father and connect with him that he didn't even wait to tell people what he was doing. He just went ahead and did it. And his sons Manasseh and Ephraim are right behind him. Now let's connect the dots of Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh and Ephraim have been born to Joseph since he was in Egypt. Joseph had no children when he was sold into slavery. He had no wife until he was promoted to prime minister. Pharaoh has changed his name from Joseph and he has been given a brand new Egyptian name. How many knew that? Let me see if I can pronounce it. The Bible says the name was Zaphnath Paneah. Everybody say that after me, Zaphnath Paneah. Good job. The point is Joseph had so many resources and so much opportunity that it would have been so easy for him to erase Jacob out of his life completely. He had no need to tell his sons anything about who Jacob was. He had no reason to explain to these boys who were born in an Egyptian palace that there was even a place called Hebron where Isaac and Abraham dwelt in tents. It's like a no whole other world that they didn't even know existed. All he had to do was simply forget where he came from and Manasseh and Ephraim would have a future that was free from any form of embarrassment that came from being one of the sons of Jacob. But the fact that Joseph is gonna see his father and Manasseh and Ephraim are right behind him meant that Joseph did something right to pour into these boys about him, how important a man their grandfather Jacob was. 
Instead of telling them about all the mistakes that he made, which is so easy to do, so tempting to do, even for us, you didn't know about what he did. I, you know, let me tell you what he did. You know, instead of doing that, Joseph had the choice to do that, but instead of doing that, he told them, boys, we're not from Egypt. We don't live here. We don't belong here. We live in a land of covenant that was given to us by the one true God. Because as you know, Pharaoh and uh, all of his people served many, many, many gods, but not the one true God. You see all these Egyptian gods, they're false gods, but there's a God that's greater than all of them, and that's the one that we worship. Yes. Joseph did something that made Manasseh and Ephraim desire a connection with their grandfather so that their identity would be connected to the promises of God and not the pleasures of Egypt. That's so important. He wanted their identity to be connected to the promises of God and not the pleasures of Egypt. So dad, let me ask you today, what are you doing to connect your children to desire the promises of God rather than the pleasures of this world? Because what you praise, your kids will pursue. And what you praise is what they will do. Let me say that again. What you praise, your kids will pursue. And what you praise, your kids will do. If you praise academic achievement and every time they come home with 100 or A-plus on their paper and you go, oh, that's so great, they'll go after academics. If you praise athletics, they'll go after athletics. If you praise your past, they'll repeat the past that you lived. Whatever you praise is what they'll pursue. So when they see you praise God, they'll pursue him too. There's a lot of rhymes in there. <laughs> Joseph had a relationship with the one true God, amen? And that relationship came as a byproduct of the life that he lived, not in Egypt, but the life that he lived before he got there. Yeah. Around Jacob's table. Did Jacob do everything right? Absolutely not. No one does. Give yourself a break, Dad. There are no perfect parents. Some don't do enough, some do too much, and some just don't. But for all that Jacob did or did not do, Joseph stayed connected to his roots. He stayed connected to the promises of God. At this point in Genesis chapter 48, Joseph does not need Jacob, but Joseph wants Jacob. Where are you in your relationship with your father? Maybe you haven't needed him for years, but do you want him? Do you want that relationship? Maybe there's no reason for your connection other than the desire of your heart to know where you come from. Joseph had lots of things that he could blame on Jacob. He could tell the whole world that his whole life was ruined by him. After all, it was Jacob who played favorites. It was Jacob who gave him that coat of many colors. It was Jacob that made him, his brothers turn on him. It was Jacob that when they threw him in a pit, he didn't come looking for him. It was Jacob that when Joseph was sold into slavery, he never stopped to see where his son was. It was Jacob that sent him on a path that went from slavery to a prison, forgotten in a dungeon for 14 years. Everything that was bad in Joseph's life was Jacob's fault. How many people do you know find it easy to blame all of their problems, all their trouble on one person. Yeah. Yeah. That's seldom the case though. You have to understand that while Joseph was on this journey, the one thing that we read throughout the whole story is that God was with him. Yes. When he was in the pit, God was with him. When he was scrubbing Potiphar's floors, God was with him. When he was in the prison, God was with him. When he was in the palace, God was with him. Joseph could see the hand of God in his life, regardless of what men had done to him. That's a great lesson to learn. And when his brothers came to Egypt, Joseph revealed himself to them. They wept over him, and he told them, what you intended for evil, God meant for good. Yes. Amen? Yes. The message is this. The same God that was with Joseph, Dad, He's the same God who is with you and with me. Through all of your past hurts, he's been right beside you. Through all of your present need, he's still our provider. And on this special day, he's there, he's here. All he wants you to do is put your hand in his and trust him to lead you through. 
Joseph had a decision to make and he made it long before his father ever made it to Egypt. Every day when he was raising Manasseh and Ephraim, he was sharing with them the stories and the heritage and the truth about where he came from. It's so important, dads, for us to do that with our kids, to let them know where we came from and where God has brought us to. He said, listen, boys, Pharaoh calls me Zaphnath Paneah. That's not my real name. My name's Joseph. He would say, you've got a grandfather. He lives in another land. And you know what? Your grandfather wrestled with God. Yeah, that's right. He wrestled with God all night long. He actually wrestled with God until God told him, let me go. And granddad said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me, man. That's how tough your granddad is. This is what Joseph is telling his kids about his dad. He told them, you've got a great grandfather, Isaac. Let's go even beyond his dad. He was laid out on an altar and he was about to be killed by his great, great grandfather. I know that's weird, but there was a ram that the one true God tied in the thicket and it spared Isaac's life. He said, you come from a long line of believers and I know that you see all of this stuff here in Egypt. I know you see everything around you and it looks like it's something that we should want but the truth is, there's nothing here that we want because everything that God has promised us is in another place. You see, Joseph did such a good job of telling Manasseh and Ephraim these stories that when Jacob showed up, their grandfather, Manasseh and Ephraim wanted to go meet him. He didn't say, hey, if some guy comes around here telling you he's my dad, hit him. <laughs> you don't want anything from my old man. Let me tell you how hard he was on me. The way that Joseph raised his sons made them have a desire to know where they came from. Joseph had a choice. He chose the right path. He chose to tell his kids about his dad and the good things about his dad instead of the bad things. How are you raising your kids? Do they want to know where they come from? It's a good question to ask. Do they have a desire to be connected to their father and to their grandfather? and great-grandfather and beyond? How did Joseph do it? I mean, he didn't spend 14 years in psychotherapy. He didn't spend hours laying on the couch telling the counselor how he'd been hurt and how his feelings had been shattered and how his self-confidence was shook. All of those things are helpful, I will grant it, but the reality of it is none of those things are healing. I'll tell you how Joseph did it. He chose to... He made a decision and he said, I'm going to forgive them for what they did to me and I'm going to do the best job I can being the best dad that I can. Yes, yes. Amen. You know, I understand you, know, you may walk through some hurt that is unspeakable. I understand that. I know people here that have gone through really, really bad things with their parents and their grandparents. I understand that your situation may not have been ideal growing up. Mine wasn't. It wasn't perfect. And today here on Father's Day, there is a hole the size of the Grand Canyon right in the middle of your heart. But what I want you to understand is that you have a choice to make. You can choose to let those things be a reason or an excuse. Or you can choose to say what the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good in my life. You can put your hand in the hand of your Heavenly Father and allow the love of your Heavenly Father to more than compensate for what never happened with your earthly father. So I want to pray for every father in this room today and for every man who needs a real relationship with Jesus. You have a choice to make today. You can choose to let the past poison your future or you can choose to see God's hand in it all and make the decision to glorify him because he is greater than any circumstance or situation. You can choose to leave here today deciding that you're going to be the best father and grandfather that you can be so that you can fulfill the verse of leaving an inheritance to your children and to your children's children. So men, as I pray for you today, all heads bowed, eyes closed, I want you to make that commitment and that choice to live for God from this moment forward. Men, raise your hands and say, Father, I pray that you would look upon the men in this room today and I pray that you would give them the courage to put all of their heart, their soul, their mind, and their body, 
all of their trust, all of their strength into your hands. I pray that every burden, every wound, every feeling of bitterness in their past, that you would heal it and you would help them to see your hand in it. Today, let them feel the loving embrace of a God who has given them all things. Most importantly, your only begotten son. Father, today, I'm asking you to give these men courage to raise their children and their grandchildren in the truth of your word so that there would be a generation that understands what it means to live for God and not for this world. I pray that every burden that is on their shoulders, that you would lift it right now in Jesus' name. I pray that every weapon that is formed against them will not prosper in Jesus' name. And I pray that every voice that rises against them in this hour, that you would silence it and that with your hand, you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out upon them blessings that they cannot contain. But that spill over to their children and their children's children in Jesus' mighty name. We receive this blessing, and all of God's children said amen and amen and amen. Amen. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise for changed lives today? In Jesus' name. Thank you.